Hello, and welcome to our next chapter, where, we'll, where we will be talking about the Helmholtz and Gibbs energies. Uh, Helmholtz you may not be familiar with, but I'm sure you've heard about the Gibbs energy before. Uh, and we're going to go through where it comes from and what makes it such a useful tool uh, when considering chemical reactions. Uh, so first of all, just to start with, we, ha we have a nice way to determine whether a process is spontaneous for an isolated system. Um, Right, the second law of thermodynamics states that the change in entropy will be positive for an irreversible process or equal to zero for a reversible process when we consider an isolated system. And when we talked about the second law, we mentioned that if we want to um, think about a particular system, we also have to think about what's happening with the surroundings because generally we're not considering isolated systems. We're, just, we're considering things that can affect their surroundings and we have to take into account what's happening there. And the Humboldts and Gibbs energies are a way for us to take this idea that we know, um, you know, this condition for spontaneity uh, in general is that delta S total for the whole universe has to be greater than zero, um, but gives us a way to find that more succinctly. Uh, and so, you know, um, this criterion here is useful, but not very practical to use on an everyday basis. Um, instead, we, we construct some other state functions that let us um, look at this. So first we're going to look at, we're going to consider a, um, a system at constant temperature and volume. Um, constant volume so that we don't have to worry about uh, work uh, involved, right? If it's a constant volume uh, system, um, then there, there's no work possible because the volume can't change if we're considering pressure volume work. Um, and so we can go ahead and write out the first law of thermodynamics for this, uh, that du is equal to dq plus dw, just by definition. But this term goes to zero because um, dv equals zero, because there's no change in the volume. So we can say that du is equal to dq uh, under these conditions. Um, and now we can go ahead and use and bring in our ds. Right, we know that ds is equal to dq reversible divided by t, and so we can, and that has to be greater than or equal to zero, and so we can combine these here. If we move the t over here, we can say that uh, t ds has to be greater than or equal to. Uh, dq because dq could be either the reversible case or the irreversible case. So if the equal sign is for if it's reversible, the greater than sign is for if it's an irreversible process. So we can say then that du has to be less than or equal to tds because du is equal to dq. So we're just substituting du in here and then just writing the equation backwards. Uh, one final step we can do to compare things to zero, right, is it positive or negative? We can subtract TDS from both sides here and we get an expression here, du minus TDS, not is equal to, but is less than or equal to zero. And this is gonna be true for Right, same, same as what applied to this inequality here, the less than applies to a spontaneous irreversible process, just like it does in the second law. And the equals applies to a reversible process. So what this tells us is that if we can find the change in internal energy minus the temperature times ds for our system, right? All everything here now just involves the system, right? Um, that tells us the spontaneity of that process happening in the system, because we're sort of taking the surroundings into account as well. Um, so if we have constant temperature and volume, right? That's what we're considering here. 
we can write this as a, uh, we can combine things here and call this du minus ts is less than or equal to zero because if we take the um, di differential of u minus ts, that's equal to du minus tds minus sdt, but temperature is constant, so this term is zero. So this, what this does is it allows us to define a new function here, which is a equals u minus ts, and this a is what we call the Helmholtz energy. And so another way of writing this equation here is that dA has to be less than or equal to zero. All right, uh, and that gives us our condition for uh, spontaneity uh, or if something is happening reversibly. So we'll go ahead and pause there, and in the next video we'll start looking at implications of this.